Still alcoholic? Yeah. I still haven't gotten a coffee cup. <laughs> and I think Polly got like a case of water or something, you know? I was talking to Tom and I told him, I said, man, this altitude has really got me. Yesterday I was really struggling with it. And, I, uh, and he says, well, how does it make you feel? And I said, I feel really brain dead. And he said, well, I don't notice any difference in you. <laughs> now, this is a guy that's willing to go to any lengths, man. We've been together for days. You know, it's really an honor to be here, and I'd really like to seriously thank Derek and uh, and uh, all the people uh, that invited me up here, and and uh, Kevin, and and uh, and especially Kelly. You know, she needs to cheer down a little bit, don't you think? <laughs> so just a little too perky, if you know what I mean. Yeah. God, every time you see her coming, you just can't help but smile. You know, it's like, oh God, here she comes again. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, you know, and I got a lot of friends here too. You know, I mean, there's people that you meet, Tom and Juanita, and and uh, um, you know, a bunch of people here. That, I mean, they're all escaping from California, coming out. Have you noticed? You know, they're all coming out here, you know, and it's, it, but it's really great, you know, to, it's like old home week, you know, Roseanne and Gil and Steve and Joanne and Joe and Kelly, it's just, it's really, it's like being home, but AA's like that, isn't it? It's like coming home, you know, I, I get, I'm very blessed that I get to travel in AA a lot, and you show up at a place, and you know, within a very few hours, you just relax, you know, so it's like when we used to drink, you'd take that drink, and it, you, it felt like it, it expanded your lung capacity, you go, oh. AA's like that. You know, you walk in, you sit down, it's like you can breathe again, like you're safe, like you're home, almost anywhere you go. Although some places do it wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I feel really good about having been invited to come here to this particular retreat because it makes me feel better about myself. Evidently, I'm okay. You know? And uh, I called my sponsor and I said, Jay, I think I'm all right. They asked me to come to Fots, you know? And he says, he told me, he gave me explicit instruction, don't screw up. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, a really amazing thing happened to me in March of 1985. Uh, an incredible thing, really. I got sober. You know, I, I think of most of us, you rarely hear the story. We talk about it sometimes, but you rarely actually hear the story where the guy is in the drunk tank and he's on his knees and he asks God for help and it just comes and then he gets sober. Most of us just fall over from the sheer exhaustion of the lifestyle, you know. We just kind of cave in, you know, and just surrender, you know. But I'm a great believer in the arrogance of alcoholism. If you see an alcoholic laying in the gutter, if his eyes are open, you can bet he's got a plan. Uh, he's thinking. You know. I mean, every one of us, every one of us, it, we've had many, many moments of clarity. Moments of clarity are very common. Most alcoholics know they're alcoholic before they get sober. Most. Every one of us, after an exceptionally interesting evening, gets up in the morning, and if you can, you look at yourself in the mirror, and you say to yourself, i got to cut this shit out. And then the very next thought is, I need a drink. <laughs> you, know. you know, so we know we need to get sober. You just can't imagine actually doing it. I mean, actually not drinking. It's hard to imagine. So when it happens, when it happens, it's a remarkable experience when that obsession gets lifted. And we don't drink. And I think after you're sober a while, you have a tendency to forget it. You take it for granted. The sober life becomes the normal life. You get used to it. 
And somehow or another, we need to look back and realize that our lives have been saved. Something really incredible happened that doesn't happen to most people. We get sober. It changes our lives. But my journey in AA really didn't begin in March of 85. It really began in March of 1954. My father got fired from the job. And rather than go to the bar, he came home. And I'm pretty sure it was my mother that called AA. And he went to a meeting in Inglewood on Western Avenue. And he went to that meeting in a little clubhouse. And he came home and he told my mother, those people have got something down there, and I'm going to go back and find out what it is. Well, the next night, she went with him in order to monitor the experience. <laughs> she showed up down there, and they walked into the clubhouse together, and this woman came up to my mother and asked her what she was doing there. She looked out of place, and she says, Well, I'm here to make sure he fills out the form and pays the dues and buys the book. And, and this woman took my mother into the other room. Don't make Al-Anon jokes if you don't know what it is. A lot of people make a lot of stupid Al-Anon jokes. But if you know what it is, you can make some great Al-Anon jokes. <laughs> Stop and think of the consciousness of an individual that would live with us on purpose. What are they thinking? <laughs> oh, this will be fun. <laughs> something to do on the weekends, you know. <laughs> kind of like restoring an old car or something. You know? <laughs> when my father died in 1999, he was 45 years sober. My mother died in 2002. She was 48 years in Al-Anon. So on top of all my other problems, I was raised in one of those god-awful AA homes. And back in the 50s, AA wasn't like it is today. Um, especially, well, I don't know about here, but in California, what those people were doing is they were building the Alcoholics Anonymous that we now enjoy on the West Coast. They were starting meetings and planning and plotting and connecting the dots and opening central offices and starting clubs. And my mother helped found the Al-Anon Central Office or the intergroup in, a in L.A. And uh, we hung out with Chuck and Clancy was the newcomer, and they all said he'd never make it. You know? And those of them that are still alive still say that about him, too. You know? you know? I've cleared that with him. It's the truth. And, uh, um, but I've been to all the potlucks and the barbecues, and, the, and now I know why we were going to Bakersfield all the time. You know? I mean, there's no good reason to go to Bakersfield. But, you know? And it was the Southern California Convention. You know. So I grew up in the, in the, in the rooms of, of AA a lot. I was six years old when he got sober, and I remember, you know, there was these meetings that they started that I would sit in the kitchen on a Friday night and bring out the coffee and the donuts during the break and hold hands with all of you go, keep coming back, it works. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I had one of those houses where we had a lot of weird uncles hanging around, you know. You know, I'd come home from school and there'd be a weird uncle laying on the back porch, you know, <laughs> waiting for his sponsor to come home, you know. <laughs> Here's a good description of hell. You're laying on some guy's back porch, you're hungover, half drunk, it's a hot day, you're sweating, you feel like hell, and there's a nine-year-old kid in your ear going, you know, you're not supposed to drink. That's called hell. Yeah. One day I came home, there was a woman hiding in the garage. That was the Al Anon. Yeah. 
We had one particular weird uncle named Harold, and uh, Harold was really a nice man. I, I, really, I really liked Harold. He was very kind to me. He was on the back porch a lot, and he just couldn't get it. He was, he'd keep drinking, and he had no car, and my dad would get him clothes and, and give him odd jobs around the house, fix and repair things, get money in his pocket, and take him to meetings. Finally, Harold got sober. And uh, he started showing up. He had a car, and he showed up, and he was dressed nice. He got a job, and he was looking good. And he met a woman in AA, and I went to the wedding when they got married. You know, then he got drunk, and he got divorced. And I went to the funeral when he burned himself up alive, drunk, smoking in bed in an old hotel. I was 13 years old when that happened, and I knew that the reason that Harold died is because he drank. I knew that it wasn't a bad accident. At 13 years old, I knew that if you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't drink. Bad things happen. Those people were around my house a lot. I watched it. I watched it happen. Now, when you're a kid, you're not really connected to what your parents are doing because they're stupid. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'd be around it, but I wasn't, like, into it. You know, I was like, and I couldn't wait to drink. Remember waiting around, you know? I mean, you have a few sips here and there somewhere, and finally you get the job done. I was probably about 14 or 15 years old. A buddy of mine's older brother had a party, and he let us drink whatever we wanted. And we went outside and had a big 16-ounce plastic cup and just poured stuff in it, choked it down, and got drunk, got hammered. I caused some trouble at the party, and they... They loaded me up in the car and they drove me back to my parents' house and dumped me out on the front lawn. I crawled in the house and crawled down the hallway into my bedroom. I'm laying on the bed and I got one foot on the floor to stop the spinning. You know? And back in those days, we had these big black plastic things called records. <laughs> I'm serious. And, uh, and they, had a, they had a little hole in the middle. And we played them on pieces of furniture called record players. <laughs> and some of these pieces of furniture had lids on them. So I puked in the record player. <clears throat> I crawled back down the hall, got into the bathroom, and I'm sitting on the toilet with a trash can between my legs because it's coming out both ends now. <laughs> bathroom door opens up. I see my mother standing there with this aghast expression on her face and my father standing behind her laughing hysterically. <laughs> and both of them in their own way were saying, Oh my God, it begins. Much like Polly, they were raising their little alcoholic, you know, and... And off I went, boy. I never knew there was a line. Didn't know there was a line. I drank for effect immediately. Uh, I was one more step up the evolutionary scale. By the time I was 17 years old, I was a bad drunk in high school. I had a bit of a problem with authority. I had the big jacket and the slouch and the sneer and, and a foul mouth and a bad attitude, and I wasn't shy. And uh, I had already been to jail by the time I was 17, and I was in trouble. I was in trouble at 17 years old. You know, the children are coming into AA now. Have you noticed? The kids are coming. Um, And I hope we accept them with open arms. When the hospitals built up around the United States, Alcoholics Anonymous developed an adversarial relationship with recovery programs. And it, I don't think it ever fully recovered. There's still an attitude about it a lot. The spin dries and stuff. This is exactly what Bill Wilson wanted. He wanted access to recovery. My father and Chuck Chamberlain and a bunch of guys were involved in what Wilson called the Big 12 Step. 
going to the government to try to get them to recognize this truly as a disease so that they'd quit incarcerating us and put us in hospitals and help us to recover and open the door to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's here now. Access to recovery is available to everyone. <laughs> David Hawkins in his book, Power vs. Force, writes that Alcoholics Anonymous is probably the single most significant social movement of the 20th century. That in the United States, in the Americas, he says, it has touched the lives of 50% of the population. That's 150 million people. There are over 300 12-step programs. You have to look at the entire thing. Look what we have spawned. Look what has happened in the world. It has changed the face of psychotherapy. It will never be the same. They now acknowledge and recognize the spiritual component of human nature. We did that. We did that. So now the children are coming, and the little bastards refuse to leave. <laughs> My home group is the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. It is where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. <laughs> On any given Monday night, there's 110 guys shoehorned into this room. And 50% uh, of that room is probably under the age of 22 years old. We had a kid about a year ago who was 15 years old taking a one-year cake. And he gave the most right-wing death squad AA pitch I have ever heard. And I've been around. And I think I'm pretty tough. This kid stood up there, and at the end of his pitch, he looked out at everybody and pointed his finger. And he said, and if you're sitting out there tonight, and you don't have a sponsor, and you don't, aren't working the steps, may God have mercy on your soul. I went right up to him and asked him to be my sponsor. For weeks after that, we were walking around going, may God have mercy on your soul. He's still there. He's two years sober now. He's the cleanup chairman. His attitude hasn't changed much either, you know. When I was 17, I was in trouble. I was a, I was a full-blown alcoholic at 17 years old. That's all I could think about. It's all I wanted to do. And I was doing it, and I was going after it, and I was living the lifestyle. It was the middle of the 60s, you know what I mean? It was a great time to be a loser. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because we had a uniform and everything, you know what I mean? It's, you know, you look at people and go, yeah, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. What's wrong with you? You know, we tattoo it on ourselves, you know. And uh, um, when I sit with those kids today, and uh, because they want what we have, they're not hanging out here because it's cool, you know. This place is not cool. Matter of fact, Scott Redmond told me once, he, he, I dearly love that man, and he said, Alcoholics Anonymous has offered me a level of lameness that I did not know was available. <laughs> <clears throat> but when I sit with them and I read the book with them and I work the steps with them or they just come over to hang out, it's like looking at myself. It's me. It's me. It's redemption. It's redemption. I know how they feel. It's not that big of a stretch, you know. The music's a little different. Not much, really, you know. And they got more metal in their face and a lot more tattoos. I'm convinced I need more tattoos. You know? <laughs> but it's redemption. It's part of what saves our souls. It's like talking to myself, you know. And, uh, but at 17, I wasn't hearing anything. Nobody was talking to me, and I was in trouble. By the time I was 22, I was in the Oregon State Mental Institution. I needed a rest. 
you know. I mean, it was the 60s, you know. I mean, the road from Los Angeles to San Francisco was a road to Nirvana. Golden Gate Park was the center of the universe. And they weren't eating hitchhikers yet, so it was safe to travel. You know, and the young ladies were discovering their sexuality, and we were helping them as best we could, you know. You'll hear guys in AA say, you know, I wouldn't trade my worst day sober for my best day drunk. I wouldn't trade 66 and 67 for anything, man. <laughs> From what I understand, it was a real hoot. You know? I can't really tell you any stories about it because I lied about it for so long that I'm really not sure what the truth is. You know, I'm pretty certain I did not live with Joan Baez. <laughs> But I said I did for years. <laughs> she still looks good to me. In 1965, the Hells Angels rode into the valley at Bass Lake, above Friends up Fresno in California. And I found my career path. I wanted to be a gangster, tough guy, you know, wear a long duster and have six shooters and, you know, something like that. It was always attractive to me, you know. I always wanted to be behind the backstop of the guys who were over there smoking, you know. So the dark side has always been attractive to me. And, uh, and I went after that. And I met her, and she was young and had long brown hair and... She lived up in Oregon and was down there for the summer, and, and we went up to Oregon together. I went back there with her, and uh, we got married and had two small children. And uh, by the time I was 22, I was sticking needles in my arm every day and drinking like a fish and running with an outlaw motorcycle gang, and I wasn't coming home to that family, and they were on welfare. And I ended up in a mental institution at 22. 22. Not much of a party, you know. A lot of us never partied. I, you know, to be truthful, I never really partied, man. It was a lifestyle. I, I lived like that. I lived it. I didn't party and then go home. And uh, you know, I think the whole idea behind the drinking thing was to have a couple of shots and get out of the house and go to the party and meet her and him, get lucky, have some fun, have some adventures. I ended up naked in my living room watching religious television, taking notes. <laughs> I'm having sex, menage a uno. <laughs> you know. you know. Next time you see some guy come into AA and he says, I'm just a party kind of guy, ask him, how many other people were at the party? <laughs> you know. We have a strange ability to end up completely alone, <laughs> physically alone. And, uh, and that was me at 22. See, my story is I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy. And I never went to the beach. <laughs> my motorcycle rarely ran. And I was afraid to fight. But I looked really good. I had a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat and a primary chain for a belt and black greasy Levi's with big black boots with chains around them. I've got tattoos all over me, but I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. <laughs> so I see there's some other phonies in the room. Anybody else here been in a mental institution? Oh, that's not enough hands. There's a whole bunch of you out there going, well, it really wasn't an institution. They were just observing me. <laughs> Only those of us that have been in a mental institution know that it's not that bad. You have some sparkling conversations in the mental institution. It's a great place to look for a bride. Uh, <laughs> geez. 
So the state of Oregon thought I should leave. I agreed, and uh, I came back down to California. Now, as Tom mentioned before in his earlier talk, uh, one of the requirements for being an alcoholic is you must hate your parents. It's just mandatory. And uh, because for the alcoholic life to seem like the only normal one, you can never, ever take responsibility for your own behavior because it's indefensible. If you take responsibility for it, you're required to change. So it's got to be someone else's fault, usually in one fashion or another. It has to be someone else's fault. And mom and dad are first. They're the, they first, they're the first ones that try to curb the fun, you know. And, uh, and I hated my parents, and I especially profoundly disliked my father. Um, when he would enter a room, it would just turn my stomach. I just absolutely hated him. And, and I'm not quite sure exactly where that comes from. But I had rage. Uh, you know, all of, us, all of us talk about feeling disconnected. You know, when, before we ever drank, that we didn't feel part of, that the alien ship dropped us off and left us with these strangers and we're waiting for the mothership to return, you know. And we have different ways of describing that. We talk about that as if it's unusual. I think every kid feels that way. Every kid, as they grow up, they disconnect. Any of you, any of us that have raised teenagers can watch it happen. At one point, you know, they're like 8, 9, 10, and you're their favorite toy, and you're going to the soccer games, and they hit 12 or 13, and you see the look in their eyes. You have become the stupidest person they've ever met in their lives. <laughs> and they feel disconnected, like nobody understands. they got too many zits, and they're gawky, and they feel weird, you know. All of us, the difference between us and them is we medicated that. We never grew up out of it. There's another term that you hear in AA. You hear this term, alcoholic thinking, as if there is such a thing. <laughs> you know, Silkworth on down, the professional community never uses that term. You only hear it in AA, usually combined with the sentence that we are of above average intelligence. <laughs> you know? But we have alcoholic thinking, you know, it's like, it's kind of like that. Well, the, the professional community calls it exactly what it is, emotional immaturity. And we hear that and we go, no. I have special thinking. And... <laughs> And you need to consider that when you're dealing with me. <laughs> That's just my opinion, but it's a really good one. <clears throat> so I hated my father profoundly, and I came back down to Los Angeles. And when you need something, you can overlook certain things. You know, <laughs> so... <clears throat> Dad let me sleep in his garage, and he gave me a job in his machine shop in El Segundo, and I tried to get normal. What normal is, is you've got to stop shooting heroin because you can't get anybody to go along with the concept of social heroin use. <laughs> it's pretty much a lifestyle. You've got to quit taking LSD because regular people have communication with each other. <laughs> and uh, LSD is not conducive to two-way communication. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I quit all that hard drug scene. I quit. I stopped. And uh, you can only drink on the weekends when you're getting normal. Because normal people have jobs. And they go to them days in a row. <laughs> I've watched them do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know. Next week, same thing over again. Monday, Tuesday, and when I drink, I don't show up no matter what. Everything stops. Here they come. <laughs> For the tape, there's automatic fire going off. <laughs> there's some fundamental sect in the hills 
coming down. We are, after all, in Colorado. <clears throat> so what you do during the week is you smoke pot, because it's green and it's from God and it's not really drugs. And uh, because I don't know about you, but the impact of your personality on me is devastating. I cannot do you. And I need something in me to cushion the blow of you on me. You know, I, I just can't do it. I never learned how. I never grew up. And I can't handle it. So I tried this experiment. The other thing for an alcoholic to get normal of my variety is you got to find a woman. Because uh, I can never ever be alone. It is a group effort getting me through life. It takes a village. You know, <laughs> um, and there are volunteers out there. <laughs> And I met her. She had long brown hair. And, uh, and we set up housekeeping. And, uh, and I tried to get normal. I tried to clean up my act. And we had two more small children. And at the age of 37 years old, 15 years after the mental institution, I was as miserable as I ever hoped to be in my life. I lived in the house with that woman and those two kids. And I had no emotional connection to another living human being. And I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know that. I can't have a separate experience and engage the one that I'm having and make the determination that there's something wrong. They're getting closer. <laughs> I think they're just outside the pavilion. Hopefully our militia is prepared. Does anybody in here have lightning bolts tattooed on their shoulder? <clears throat> so like any good gangster, I called my mother. <laughs> Next time you see some big badass guy come into AA, ask him, do you live with your mom? Is, chances are, chances are, you know, and he probably bad mouths her. Well, she doesn't understand me. Well, you're 45 years old, man. And it's like, <laughs> so my mother came and got me, and she checked me into a place called Starting Point in Costa Mesa, California, and I spent 35 days in there. My parents took me to my first therapist when I was 13 years old because of the rage, because I had rage. I would have rage seizures. I would double over, fall on the floor, the bile from my stomach would come up into my mouth, my veins in my neck would throb, and eyes bulge, and fist into the wall, head into the wall, at the injustice of it all, you know? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. You know, I've struggled with it most of my life. And uh, they took me to a shrink. I spent a year and a half with him, and he really helped me. And what he really did is he introduced me to my favorite subject, me. <laughs> that lifelong pursuit of self. And uh, I've spent two different tours of duty in the mental institution. I was two and a half years in a group therapy situation at one time. I've been to several other therapists for one thing or another. I've been gestalted and rolfed and primal screamed. I know more about myself than is safe to know. So when I really was reaching out for help, I couldn't imagine just coming here and going to meetings and not drinking. I need more therapy. I need to be put in so I need to be locked up somewhere. You know, I need medical attention and I need I need therapy. 
you know, I'm just kind of a sensitive guy in a cold, cruel world, you know, and I, I need somebody to really listen to me, to understand, to help me flesh out the root cause of my problems. And once that I can expose them to the light of day and really see them for what they are, I can adjust my behavior accordingly and then everything will be fine. <laughs> I don't think that works, you know. So while I was in this place for 35 days, they made me wear a sign around my neck. I had to make the sign. We made it in crafts. <laughs> it was a little rectangular piece of cardboard with a string that went through it that said, I am not a counselor. Because <laughs> evidently there was some confusion about that. I used to help guys do their inventory. I swear to God. I'd tell them, put some homosexual stuff in there. It makes them think you're telling the truth. You know. They like to read about that. And you probably did, you just don't remember. You know? Well, you know, I, I woke up with a couple of guys, but it wasn't anything serious, you know. It's just like... Well, hello. <laughs> we share in a general way. You know. <clears throat> Dear me. And, uh, so after 35 days, they let me out. <laughs> they just let us out, you know. They go forth, multiply. You know, like, <laughs> like we're okay now. You know, we're all right. And uh, where do we end up? AA. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. You know, it's linoleum floors and metal folding chairs for the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> it's like party. <laughs> There are no referrals from Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no place you walk into and you say to them, I'm from AA, they sent me here. <laughs> this, is, this is it. The inmates are running the asylum. We are the therapists. You know, we're the counselors. People ask me for relationship advice. I've been married three times. And I give them advice. Don't you love it? We're experts. <clears throat> you ever had anybody say, so what happens now? We're sober, we walk into AA. What, what now? What are we going to do? We sat around all this weekend talking about the steps and kind of the mechanics of it and how it works and kind of what doesn't and what does and what we think is correct or the right approach or an intense approach or, you know, is there a weak approach, a medium approach, a strong approach? Yeah, there is. There's weak AA, there's medium AA, and there's strong AA. And if you've been around AA long enough, you've done all three, you know, and the strong one works better. But I'm a new guy in AA. What happens now? What happens to me? I just wander in. They don't tell me, go here, these people are better. They just say, go to meetings. So I go to me. So what happens? What's the journey? We talked about 1985. I got awakened. What a remarkable experience. Some years later, I was sitting with a, a friend of mine got involved with this Indian guru, and he says, why don't you come with me? He's given a talk, and we can hang out, spend the afternoon together. And this is a neat guy, you know, and I was really intrigued by all this. And I'm sitting in the room with this guru, and at one point he starts laughing at me. They, that's what they do. They laugh at us. And I said, what are you laughing at? And he goes, I just love you alcoholics and drug addicts. And I said, why? He says, well, the rest of them out there are trying to get awakened. You're just trying to figure out what the hell happened. <laughs> he says, you're already there. You just don't know it. You know, you're easy, you know. And, uh, and I believe that. I believe we've been awakened. I think a remarkable, we call it God's grace, something touched us, something very special, 
something that shouldn't be squandered. And uh, the rest of the journey is to take that awakening and turn it into some kind of an awareness where we're actually conscious of the fact that we're awake and that we can do something with that, really focus on it, look at it, and watch ourselves move through life. Earlier this in the week, we were talking about the six and seven step, about character defects. How do they get addressed? What happens? What, you know, functionally, how does it work? Is it just prayer and meditation? We talk about finding a higher power that will solve our problems. How functionally, how does that work? I think I know. I think I know. At least I have my own experience. I mean, you'll hear people in AA say, the longer I'm sober, the less I know. Don't you wonder about those people? Like, aren't they paying attention? It, to me, it's just, you know, spiritual pride, you know, couched in false humility. You know, I've been sober 23 years. I damn well better know some stuff. You know, I've been paying attention most of the time. You know, people come and ask me for help. Do I have any? Do I have a message that has depth and weight? And how did I get, if I do, how did it get there? What happened to me? You ever had anybody say to you, he's not emotionally available for me? You ever heard that? Usually in family group. You know, when she finally looks at you and looks at the therapist and says, he's just not emotionally available for me. You know what they mean by that? What they mean by that is I've got something that they want and I'm withholding it. The truth is worse. I don't have it. And what's worse than that, it gets worse. What's worse than that is I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it, and I'm helping you look for it. And this dance is going to go on forever. Forever. Now that I'm a newcomer, now that I'm sober, and I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm going to 875 meetings a week, <laughs> and I've got the sponsor thing, and I'm as obsessed as I've ever been, you know, it just looks a little different. I'm not drooling on myself anymore, you know, but I'm probably out of the house more than I was before. Now that, if, now that I'm sober, if you would like me to be emotionally available for you, it's going to take about at least 10 years. I'm serious. When you and I started drinking and or using, we stopped growing emotionally. We stopped. We missed all the lessons. You know, We never learned how to have healthy relationships. We've never really had a broken heart. We've just gotten really pissed when somebody didn't do what we wanted them to do. You know, and we mistake that for some sort of an emotional life. You know, it's either rage or euphoria. You know, I mean, it's that. A very little middle ground, you know. And we skipped it all. Now that we're sober, we're going to have to live through the experiences again. You cannot speed that process up, but you can definitely slow it down by picking and choosing what you will and won't do. The most spiritual thing said in Alcoholics Anonymous is, get in the car. <laughs> Just get in the car. Well, where are we going? What do you care? Get in the car. And for some god-awful reason, I got in the car. I got in the car. I guess I got intrigued with you right away. I'm one of the lucky ones. I've always liked it. Always. Even when I struggled against it. You know? And the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is something to be survived. <laughs> this is the character defect center of the known universe. <laughs> you know? You won't keep me sober. You'll hit on my wife. You'll borrow money from me and you won't pay me back. You know? I'll give you a job. You'll do a shitty job and somehow it'll be my fault. That's my personal favorite. And then you won't show up to my birthday party after all I've done for you. you know? So I need something more than that. I need something more than that. I was very lucky that I got a sponsor that took me into his home Thursday at 5 o'clock was my time slot. 
He said, read the doctor's opinion, make notes in the margin, and we'll discuss it. So I read the doctor's opinion. When I got to his house, he did not trust me that I'd read it, so he had me sit there and read it to him out loud. (laughs) And we discussed my notes. And he gave me air time. He gave me his time. And he told me things like, I'd be happy, I'm, as your sponsor, my job is to guide you through the process of the 12 steps so that you will find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problems. To bring about this psychic change that we read about in the doctor's opinion, and he helped define that for me. We talked about that. He says, now I'd be happy to sit here and talk to you about what you think your problems are so that you will not share about them in the meetings. <laughs> he said, the meetings are for recovery from alcoholism, not about how your day went. And uh, I made it. People don't always clap when you say that. I immediately went back to his house and I said, You know, they're breaking that rule down at the Alano Club right and left. And he told me, Alcoholics Anonymous is a safe place. You can talk about whatever you want. What I understand about that today is that when you see people doing that is that they don't have a sponsor or at least one that they're talking to and they're using the meeting as their sponsor and when people are using meetings when they mistake the meetings for Alcoholics Anonymous it becomes very critical how the meetings are run because they're getting the message that they need from that meeting So it's very important that the meeting be structured correctly so that they can get what they need from it because they're not bringing anything to it. And they don't know that. That's just what I observe. I've had the same sponsor for 23 years. We communicate regularly. We always have for the most part. I mean, there's been periods where that wasn't true. But he, this man took me through these steps week by week, We read a chapter a week for a period of time, and he got me into an inventory. And I did a fifth step. Then we made a list of amends, and I went about the process of making the amends. And one of the amends I had to make was to my father. And I knew I had to do it. I still really dislike the man. But by this time, I had learned that I cannot live with that kind of rage, that it will kill me. And it was leaking out all over everything around me. And on his 70th birthday, I went to him and I I took him into another room and I sat him down and he looked at me and he says, you don't have to do this. And I said, you more than anybody know that I do. (laughs) And I told him, I said, you're my father and I love you and I don't want to hate you anymore. And we talked a little bit and I drove home that night and it was like something reached down inside of me and just pulled that rage right out of me. I will never, I hope, I never forget that experience. It was my personal experience. It was my spiritual experience. I felt that rage go away. My father and I discovered each other in AA. We couldn't share anything together most of our life. He didn't like me much either, and uh, (laughs) for a very good reason. And uh, I was a bad boy. I broke into their house and stole their TV set. He came, tracked me down, found me, and took it back. (laughs) Oh, God. One of the high points. uh, His birthday was March the 28th. Mine is March the 27th. For 14 years, we gave each other birthday cakes. Each other at the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. It was a very special, it was the Gordon and Bill night in the meeting. It was a very special night. And I found my daddy. And uh, was he Ward Cleaver? No. And he's my daddy. He was my father. And I fell in love with him. If I can grasp the idea that I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable, early on they, they took it easy on us and they told us, well, we're powerless over alcohol. They didn't tell us up front that we're powerless over everything. Thank goodness. I've come to understand the depth of that step and the good news that it really brings. I am absolutely, utterly powerless over everything. 
I have no control over the people that live around me or with me. That's obvious. I have no control over the geopolitical situation in the world. Look at it, you know. You know, I have no control over anything. Absolutely none. And if I have no control, how could I possibly manage anything? You know, managers have power. They have control. They have power. But I have none. I have no power. So I can't manage anything. This is good news. Because even if I think I do have power and I can manage, in nature, I don't. Therein lies my suffering. It doesn't change just because I think I have it. The truth is, the immutable law is, I am absolutely powerless. I am dependent upon others around me. I am part of a larger whole, whether I like it or not. And if I step outside of that circle, away from that larger whole, therein lies my suffering. If I can grasp that first step, then the second step becomes operational. I need a manager. I need somebody to step in or something, some entity, something to step in and take over. The truth really about that is it already has. It already has. I'm just acknowledging it. I'm just stepping out of the way, if you will. So if I can do that second step and I can say I need a manager, the third step becomes operational. What do you do? You turn your life and will over to it. Well, what life and will? The fourth step. The resentments, the fears, and the broken relationships that comes from a life with seeming power and manageability. You know, I have resentments because I can't control anything and people are continually doing things their own way and it makes me mad, it makes me angry. You know, whenever, whenever you see somebody puts down the government, the DMV, which I did, all those things, you know, I'm, I think I'm anti-establishment. No, I'm just disconnected. I don't get it. I don't like this reality. You know, therefore I have lots of fear because deep down underneath I believe that I am out of control. That I am, and therein lies all my fears. And if you're filled with resentment and fear, how could you possibly have anything remotely resembling a, a healthy relationship of any kind? And then the ceremony that we do to complete the third step is the fifth step. It's the ceremony that we go through with myself, another human being, and the manager. Here, you take it. I'm done. I'm pooped. And we physically, literally, Turn it over. Write it down. Acknowledge it. Recognize it. And give it away. Here, you take it. The sixth and seventh step are two paragraphs in the book. For good reason, there's really nothing to do. I can see what the character defects are in the fourth column of the resentment list, my faults and mistakes. And I can acknowledge them. And I can become willing. But I think the actual fact of that comes later. The manager then gives us a job. He says, make amends, make a list, take all the resentment people, put it on there, and anything else you can come up with, and go about the process of making amends. So I do that. I make the amends. Around that time that I was doing this, uh, Clancy and a bunch of people were taking meetings to Russia. And I got on the mailing for that. And I went to my sponsor and I said, I'm going to go to Russia and carry the message. He says, why don't you go to Oregon and make amends? And I did. I did. I went to those two kids up there that are still in a lot of trouble. They're 40 years old, and they're a mess. And, uh, and I made amends to those children and to that ex-wife. And, and uh, So I get to the bottom of the ninth step. You'll hear people say, put yourself at the top of the amends list. You've been your own worst enemy. That'll pretty much kill you. You, know? you want to make amends to yourself? Put yourself at the bottom. By the time you get there, you'll have some self-esteem. I think that's how it works. You'll hear people say things like, take what you can use and leave the rest. Please. That's the way I lived my whole damn life. Taking what I wanted and anything that made me remotely uncomfortable, I avoided like the plague. You know, and you're going to let me do that with AA to make it more comfortable for me? Recovery by its very nature is uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not doing much. I've just simply gotten used to it. You know? And uh, so we get to the bottom of that list. Now, when I finish my amends, am I emotionally available? You know, am I there for you? No. 
Now there's hope. Just a ray of hope that maybe someday, if we're lucky, I'll have some compassion, you know. I've done about 15% of the program at this point. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous to me is not about inventory after inventory after inventory. That's just another form of self-obsession, you know. But now there's hope. I've done Sober 101. I've done the basics. I've gone to the beginning class, and I've, and I've passed the class. I've done the best I can. You know, ten years from now, when I'm ten years sober, I'll probably do a lot more of that work. Even within that ten years, more will be revealed. More will come up. And the way it gets revealed and the way it comes up is you bring it to me. I try to interact with you. I try to have relationships. I try to make friends. And I get hurt, and I get pissed off, and I get angry, and I have bad behavior because I'm 40 years old, and I've got the emotional development of a 16-year-old, and that kid was not an honor student. He's the one with a bit of a problem with authority, you know. 10, 11, and 12 people talk about the maintenance steps. Maintain what? What have I got? Is this thing, is it truly, is it just about not drinking? I don't think so. I think it's the number one priority because without that, nothing else can come. But at this point, it's about growing up. It's about having this rich, full life that we talk about. It's about connecting with other human beings. It's about receiving love and giving love. And we don't know much about any of that. We mistake intimacy with sex. Sex is a celebration of the intimacy in a relationship. It's a celebratory thing. If I don't have much sex in my relationship, maybe there's nothing to celebrate. I'm serious. Intimacy to me is when I'm capable of feeling what you feel, not just react to how you feel impacts me. It's when I actually feel, when I can put myself in your shoes. And you and I, as alcoholics, we immediately connect with each other because we come from the same place. Later on, we both really connect with each other because we have a way out upon which we can all agree. And when we both know the way out and we start sharing that, things get really interesting. When we can truly be emotionally honest, when does that happen? Only when we can see it. And that only comes in time, through experience. This thing is experiential, not intellectual. I have to live my way through it and come and not run away, not run away, a hard thing to do. We're runners. Maybe we don't physically run away, but we definitely shut down and slink away. You know, we believe that we are our thinking mind. We believe that what we think is who we are. It couldn't be any farther from the truth. And we're not in touch with that aspect of our nature yet, not for quite a while. The tenth step is about the continuing inventory process. The awareness, being aware, living the examined life, paying attention, looking at it and paying attention. It is joined at the hip with the eleventh step. That when I sit in prayer and meditation and I ask for help, I am living that examined life. It's because I'm looking at it and I'm saying, please help me. So when this manager sends me help, I shouldn't turn it away. And it's going to look a lot like you. He's going to send me you. And I'm not going to want to deal with you. I'm going to want to run away from you. Yes, I want patience and tolerance, but not with you. I just want it to magically appear to where suddenly I just love you without the pain of having to deal with you, you know. You never say no. I live by two rules. The twelfth step is why we were saved. It's where everything happens. Everything happens in the twelfth step. It all happens. In the ninth step, we get some self-esteem. We start to feel better about ourselves. In this 12th step is when it all changes, when it all happens, when it all comes home. 
This is where we're going to spend the rest of our lives, is in this 12th step. I don't think he was kidding when he wrote, our very lives depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. Isn't that intimacy? Isn't that what he's driving? How do I know what your needs are unless I can feel you in my life? I live by two rules. I always answer the phone. I don't have caller ID. I'm not afraid for anybody to call me. I'm not hiding from anybody. I have no secrets anymore. And you are always more important than whatever rerun of Law & Order I'm watching. (laughs) Although many times I don't believe that. (laughs) But I have to paint myself in a corner, so I always answer the phone. Always. Rule number two, never, ever say no. There's never a good reason to say no, ever. If I have faith that this manager is going to run my life, I need to let it do it. I need to go along with it somehow. These are my two little stupid God tricks. When I'm asked, I just go. When anybody comes up and asks me for help, I just say yes. How could I not? I used to stand up at these podiums and I'd say that if you were on medication, you weren't sober. You know why I said that? Because I heard some of you say that, and I thought it was a real good right-wing badass opinion to have, you know. It's the old biker in me. Let's piss him off. I had no experience, but I had an opinion. (laughs) Then this guy walked up to me, and he asked me, he says, will you be my sponsor? But I think I should tell you I'm bipolar and I'm on medication. And I went, oh, geez, one of these losers. (laughs) But I can't say no, ever ever to anybody. So I said, okay, we'll give it a shot. I start reading the book with this guy, and I had the experience of peeling him off the ceiling and lifting him up off the floor. One time he came across my living room and he curled himself up in my lap and put his head in my neck and cried like a baby. Forty-year-old man, that will get your attention. (laughs) Now when I see that guy come and I say, have you taken your medication? Because you have issues, dude. There's some stuff going on with you. You So I had an opinion. Then I had an experience. And it changed my opinion. That's how it works. That's why you never say no. I I never have had a good idea what was good for me, where I should be. Now, I believe that all newcomers are bipolar. And I think the entire medical profession wants to medicate us for whatever reason. And there's a lot of stuff I don't agree with, but I do know that people have demons that I don't have. People have problems that I don't have. Woman, I did this rant one time, and this woman said to me, well, this girl came up and asked me to sponsor her, and she's a cocaine addict, and I've never had any experience with cocaine. And I told her, no, what do you think? And I said, well, you're never going to learn about cocaine addiction now because you sent her away. And probably she doesn't have any problem being a cocaine addict. She's probably looking for some recovery. Don't you know about that? And how do you know that this girl wasn't supposed to come to you and hang on to you for a while until she found the right person to be with? That's happened to me a lot. People come to me. I've had guys come up and ask me to sponsor them who have never been drunk. And I, I, this guy asked me this, and I said, why are you here? And he said, well, my therapist sent me here to work on my social skills. Now, I sat there and I thought, this is a good time to say no. Nobody could argue with this, you know. But I told him, I said, okay, I'll do it, but don't tell anybody. And... uh, I worked the steps with him, and he did an inventory and everything. And at the time, I was riding bicycles. I was getting in shape. I was trying to regain my health. I have a bad liver and stuff. And I wanted to ride a century, and this guy was a cyclist. And I couldn't find anybody to go with me. And he said, I'll go with you. He'd been riding for years. And at about 70 miles, I wanted to quit. And he stayed with me. He says, no, man, don't quit. I'll help you. I'll, I'll be with you. And I made it. Now, why do you suppose he was sent to me? 
I think I know. <laughs> but see, I can't figure this stuff out. I can't, I can't determine that something I do over here is going to affect me way over here or why somebody is being sent to me. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of Alcoholics Anonymous to be there. For that, I am responsible. Is that true? You know? So I can tell them where I think they belong. I've got connections in other fellowships. You know, I'm my own little central office. You know? <laughs> my sponsor calls me up and he says, Is this command central? <laughs> you know? Some of you get my emails. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm screwed up. You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm lo I believe it all. I believe it all. I live it as best I can. I have a wonderful life. I met a woman in AA. We live in a home. She's sober. She sponsors lots of people. And there's guys on my back porch. You know, we try to separate the girls and boys, but you know. <laughs> in closing, I'd like to tell you one little quick story. We got a little time. Um, this whole intimacy thing, the reason I talk about it is because it's what's happening to me right now. It's what's going on in my life right now. Another door has opened, another level, another dimension that I didn't know was there because I can't see beyond my own experience. When I was about two or three years sober, I was sponsoring this guy whose mother was dying. And he was standing in my kitchen and she was in the hospital and he gave him my phone number because he knew that that's where he'd be. And they called and he got up to leave and he wasn't leaving. And I knew what he wanted and I did not want to go. I'd never seen anybody dying. I didn't think we needed to do that. I mean, we're just lay people, right? We don't, there's limitations on what we can do and how we participate because, you know, I don't want to get too uncomfortable. And he wouldn't leave and I knew what he wanted and I asked him, do you want me to go with you? And he said, would you please? And he had a brother and a sister, but they trust us for some reason. They trust us more than their own family. What is that? They hardly know us. And they trust us. They put their lives in our hands. They literally do that. They put their lives in our hands. So I went with him and I walked in the room and it was awful. She's all hooked up to tubes. She was, you know, at the end. And I found a chair in the corner of the room and I sat there. And I closed my eyes and I breathed. And a feeling came over me. And the feeling was, there's nothing wrong here, Bill. Everything's okay. This is not a mistake. It's all right. Relax. And I got Al to come sit with me. He's as big as I am, but he's a larger man. He's got big hands. He's a carpenter. And he sat down next to me, and I held his hand, and I looked in his eyes, and I said, Al, it's okay, man. There's nothing wrong. It's all right. And we prayed together. And we were holding hands like this. And as we prayed, I felt his hand relax in mind. That's intimacy. It's very quiet. It's subtle, as most emotions are. And I miss it all the time. And unless I allow myself to be taken to places that I'm unfamiliar with, the spiritual experience isn't going to happen. It always happens when I'm uncomfortable or I'm in a strange place and I don't know the rules and I don't know what's going on. Fast forward 20 years. My parents, my dad got cancer. My mother and I nursed him. We changed his diapers. We took care of him. You came to meetings at the house. And I watched my father, watched his light go into another room. And he was okay. He was all right. He had the cell phone in his hand all the time, and you would call him all the time. Half the time he didn't know who you were. It didn't matter. He loved Alcoholics Anonymous right up to the end. And his son was there. His big, strong son was there to care for him. The greatest gift we give our family is they don't have to worry about us anymore. We're okay now. We're not broken. We're okay. My mother moved in with Karen and I, and she got cancer. She's 85. And I nursed her by myself for about three months. She decided not to do the chemo just like my dad. She goes, I'm going to go out like dad. And then one day I'm standing by the side of the bed and it was time to change the diaper. No one else was there. And I was standing there and she looked at me and she started crying because she thought she'd lost her dignity. And she looked at me and she says, I never raised you to do this. And I thought about that and I said, oh, yes, you did. I remember that house I grew up in. You were saving those people's lives. 
I know what you were doing now. I know what you were doing. So roll over. (laughs) And I changed her diapers. The next time it was easier. The next time after that, she goes, Bill, it's time. (laughs) And we entered a level of, of intimacy we didn't know was there. And it wasn't the physical part. It's just caring for another human being. It's just being there. You can't love until your heart's been broken. Love fearlessly. Love recklessly. Don't put any limitations on this. The manager will take really good care of you. He'll send you to places like Copper Canyon, you know. You know. You get to go places, do things you never thought you would do, be with people you never thought you could be with. I love my wife with an intensity that scares me sometimes. Because like most of you, if I get too close, my God, what will happen if I lose it? I've watched several of my friends in AA pass away, and I've been there for them. I've showed up whenever I've been asked to. And what the gift that I've received for that is not monetary. It's I've fallen in love with you, and I can feel the love that you have for me all the time, all the time. And that manifests between Karen and I. And we have that house that I was raised in. All of you are there all the time. We have no idea what we would do without you. I love you very much. Thank you.